Random Nomads, episode 30. Have an open conversation about your joint life and how you deal with money. And sometimes you might need professional help, but um, it's not a single conversation that's over. Because when couples talk about money, there can be a lot of emotions involved. And how you, you know, how you were raised, and this is how you look at money. And your spouse may be raised another way way and even in another culture where money is defined differently so it goes very deep into you know first of all how each of you view your money and resources and finances and your relationship welcome to tandem nomads where inspiring expat partners from around the world share with you how they turn the challenges of relocation into great opportunities. So are you following your partner abroad for his or her career? Then Tandem Nomads is the place for you. Go to tandemnomads.com and sign up for the newsletter. Hello, Nomad Nation. This is Emel Deregi. And today's episode is about planning our finances to live the life we want. It is already quite complicated to manage our household's finances in general, but it does tend to get a bit more complicated when we move from a country to another. I also noticed that in a lot of cases... Even when expert partners are financially dependent, they are involved in managing the finances of their household, which I believe is very important. So for that reason, I brought to you today a very special guest and expert in financial planning, Hui Chin Chen. Hui Chin, are you ready for the ride? Yes, I am. Hui Chin Chen has lived in constant transitions for the past 12 years. She is a native of Taiwan. She has moved to the U.S., then India, Mexico, New Zealand, and soon, soon to go back to Taiwan with her husband. So she is now the co-owner of Pavlo Financial Planning in Virginia, where she works virtually with global mobile American families. She helps them organize their finances around the life they want to live. She also blogs about personal finance topics at Money Matters for Globetrotters. So Hui Chin, this was a very short overview of who you are. Could you tell us more about your experience as a globetrotter and an expat partner? Um, sure. Uh, that was a pretty good summary. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I left Taiwan in 2004 to, um, to the U.S. to go to grad school and graduate school. And that's where I met my husband. And after graduating, I stayed in the U.S. for a few years for work, but eventually decided that I wanted to do something more and I wasn't living the life that I was expecting. So I quit my job and found a job in India and I moved there. And at that point, um, really decided that um, both my husband and I at that time decided that we wanted to be together. So <laughs> by the end of um, my work in India, I decided to get married. And after a few months, we got married in Taiwan. And he at that point had already gone into foreign service. And by the time we got married, he had moved to his first post in Mexico. Okay. So after we got married, I just joined him. In okay. Mexico. So you've been going to Mexico and then New Zealand, and you told me previously you're going soon to Taiwan. Yes, so oh, that would be um, <laughs> our next destination in about five and a half months. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's great. A lot of globetrotting. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> it's just one place to the other. <laughs> yeah, and like you say, money matters when for globetrotters. So tell me, how did you, how did you start this company? Um. Actually, my company is called Pavlov Financial Planning, and it was started before I joined. So I met my partner during a residency program, a financial planning re residency program. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it was just, you know, we we're both students in that program. But I was at the point where I need to decide whether I want to continue uh, the route of financial planning. At that point, he already started his own firm, but in the very beginning. So he is located in, he was located in Arlington, and at that time I was in Mexico. So there was a few months, about three, four months of training my husband needed to have between Mexico and New Zealand. So we were back in Arlington. So I sought him out and, you know, just had coffee and discussed and 
figure out there's something there's an opportunity for us to do something together so That's yeah good. it just happened that way <laughs> and you specialized in families who move um, globally from a country to another um, what makes it different than those who don't move to f- plan our finances it's actually surprisingly little the important things are global really about what kind of life you want to live like what you you were in, in the introduction you were saying before it's really the financial planning is about planning your life and the finances is part of it because everything you do has to do with money <laughs> you mm-hmm. know and not very many people in this world can have um can make decisions without thinking about money. So eventually it's all tied back to how you use your resources. And it's not just your time and your energy. So um, overall, it's similar in that sense, but it's just for the globally mobile families, there are many more things to keep track of, like where you're going, are you going to have any financial ties with that country? What does it mean for your financial obligations from your home country or from your last country? Um, how do you actually even withdraw money and then how do you plan for retirement when you're going from one country to the next and you don't have pension in this country, you might have pension in that country. Yeah, so so a lot more things to think about. And for the people who travel around the world, it's, it's very helpful to have somebody who has more experience in that and just have knowledge in that, so sort of keep you on track. So what's the first thing to do if we want to, you know, clear up our financial planning and be more, um, you know, diligent with it? I would say that if you are not on this journey yet, so which I think probably most people who are listening now may already be overseas, but if you're just deciding that you got a job offer overseas and you're deciding you should go and you decided you want to go but you haven't gone that's the actually the first ideal perfect timing for you to look at your finances because the the best thing you can plan is before you go because once you go you're in, you're no longer in the country you were in before and then there are other implications mm-hmm. so, so if if we know that we're going what should we look at so there are the short terms and the long term. And I think some guests from your show discussed before how we usually focus on the short term where you're moving or forgot, forget about the long term. Mm-hmm. So as a financial planner, I always start with the long term because when you're moving around, it's like you always need a center or you need a focus. Mm-hmm. And you can't focus on something that's very close to you. In, like, it, it just think about it as a journey or you're hiking, you're walking towards some place. And the only thing that doesn't change is the thing that's really far away. So when you have all the um, just frantic things, then the things that you know about that you had to deal with in the short term, just you need to always remember why you're doing this. Mm -hmm. So why are you going overseas? Is this for your career, your spouse's career, because you really like traveling, because you want the experience? Um, Make sure that's focal in you know, in, in your financial plan that this is the reason why we're doing this. Mm-hmm. And once that's clear, and for both of you, what are the, uh, I usually start with three long-term goals or three, not like within six months goals. So th- three, maybe one goal from between one to five years, another goal from five to 10, another goal maybe very far away, like, you know, when you want to retire and things like that. But write them out and make it very specific and define it very clearly between you. So you know everything that you're dealing dealing with your money and your finances and the insurance you need to buy and everything is because you want to achieve those three goals. That's a very good point you're making, you know, that before even starting to look at our accounts, it's important to know what we want out of our lives and what are our goals. Is it to settle in a country? Is it to buy a house? Is it to live in a certain country? And what it means in terms of money, I guess, how much do I have to earn or save for it, Right. Yeah, and I, th- I, one problem that, I guess a good problem that many expats run into is that if you have a good expat package that gives you housing when you're overseas and you suddenly have all that chunk of money you don't have to pay on your housing, 
and then you start thinking, oh, what I should do with that money? And it's it's sort of like um, a f- I wouldn't say not a good way to think about it, but it's more like you only think about what you should do with your extra until you have the extra. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and but the better way to look at it is that. No matter you have extra money or not, really, what's more important is what you want to achieve in life. So, no matter how little or much money you have, you know how to appropriate them mm-hmm. the right way. Very good point. So, you said first thing is to think about what we want to realize, and then we break it down into at least three goals. You mentioned one to five, five to ten. That's what you said. Yes. Yeah, so, usually, because it's usually very easy. Easy to focus on the immediate term. I was like within one year, so I usually encourage people to think um, further. So you can do one to five years and five to ten years. So it gives you like more like short term, mid term, and long term sort of thing. And it those those goals change because if you have a one to five year term goal and you're likely to achieve it in year two, that means you have, you know, now you have another goal <laughs> yeah. you can put in. Put in place. So. Could you give us examples? I'm um, sure. Um, one common thing um, or sequence of goals that I've looked at with people is um, some people want to buy a property in their home country, and that's usually more um, short term. Although they don't necessarily need to live in it so when they're overseas, but there's always a oh, it would be nice to have a place for our children to go back to. Mm-hmm. Um, so that could be a one to five year term goal because you need to start saving for, you might have enough income to pay mortgage, but you might need to save for down payment and things, or actually have time to look for a property. Mm-hmm. So it won't happen immediately, but it might happen pretty soon. And then some people, um, when they have children, they want to be able to provide for their college expenses. And that could be very soon, depending on how old your children are. And it could be further away, like 10 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, then the very long-term goal usually is the retirement. It depends on how old you are right now. But mm-hmm. that would be the very long-term goal. Okay, so once you help them, we have these three examples. The first uh, like goal is to buy a small house. The second one is to save for kids' uh, college. And then the third one, which is a much longer one, is retire, um, the retirement plan. So once you've done that with your clients, what's the next step? Well, usually, actually... With the goals, it's the it's most important to not just say, "Oh, this is what I want." It's like very specific on the. I wouldn't say it has to happen exactly the way you want, but it has to be. Um, the better you define it, the easier it is to plan mm-hmm. on how to get there. Mm-hmm. So if you can say that, "Oh, I will try to save enough." for a house, housing down payment in two years. That way you can easily calculate how much you need to save per month, mm-hmm. right? So um, so I usually try to um, do that with my clients to make it specific so I can actually do the analysis on exactly how much you should save and to do projections for long-term, whether it's likely what you can save can meet your goal and what kind of investments you should put into those accounts. So is there a part where we also analyze what our expenses are at the moment, our lifestyle? Yeah, so that's actually, um, I guess it could be in the very beginning um, before you look at the goals, but I usually look at it after the goals and because people have different ways of managing money and I don't always um, say that I need to look at your budget and you need to start, you know, spending so much. And I don't usually take that approach. So I will look at what whatever they're currently spending and whatever surplus they have and see what's the best way to appropriate it. So if you have very uh, aggressive goals, like I want to retire at 40 years old and you're already 35 and you haven't saved that much, then that's very obvious you're not going to meet your goal. So, but I can, <laughs> I can show you that, okay, then this is how much you need to save and, and you are not saving that much. So mm-hmm. what can you do in your budget? So if it's sort of like, if you have, 
if you are pretty good with budgeting, which I think a lot of the um, tandem globe trotting couples are pretty good at, mm -hmm. it's um, I don't necessarily get into that part. But um, if they if their goals are really aggressive and it requires even heavier budgeting, I can help with that too. Okay, I see. So what is your advice for expat partners to and, and expats in general to, to actually manage their finances? Once they manage their goals, they know uh, how much they save, what should they do? Well, get organized, <laughs> which is actually difficult uh, for our lifestyle and I think a lot of your previous guests mentioned it and like some other guests have um, checklists and th things like that um, that they designed to help people and um, I personally designed one as well for um, people who are move maybe moving for the first time or moving for the hundredth time a sort of pre moving overseas checklist of all the fi personal finance topics that you need to make sure you check. So once you know your goals, the easier it is to assign whatever accounts or assets you have to that goal, knowing that you know it's it's you're not just saving for um, anything or a very distant future or not knowing what that money is going to be used for. Yeah. Like if you have a very specific idea of why you're saving. Yeah. I see. You have actually in your blog a series for trailing spouses uh, to help trailing spouses manage their finances. A lot of these trailing spouses actually are not financially independent. So how do you think trailing spouses or what do you think trailing spouses should do to, to be able to manage their own finances in this situation? And I personally have a pretty strong opinion about the term financial independence <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because I don't think that's People use that term for um, a lot of different things. I personally don't think you can ever achieve independence in that sense because you're always relying on something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's, I guess it's just more like a personal taste of, you know, you're never, you're never completely independent. You're always dependent on something. Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, if you accept that, <laughs> that's much, you ma it makes you much happier. It's either you're dependent on investments or dependent on your rental property. So you're dependent on your, you know, your husband's income, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but the original question is, so if you're, if you're a trailing spouse, you're not working, how much you should be involved mm -hmm. in managing your household finances. And I personally don't think it has to do with um, if you're working or not. It's just for um, spouses that are not working, it seems more like natural just to take over that part of the household work because mm -hmm. you feel like maybe because you have time or because... You feel like you you need to contribute your family some way, so I know a lot of training spouses either working or not working they would take over your finances. Mm -hmm. But I really don't think it it's dependent on the fact that you're trailing. Uh, that's a very good point. I like what you're saying. You know the fact that and this is this was I was trying to get that point, and I'm very happy you said it. You know that this it's all about the relationship. You know about the agreement in the relationship of how we want to live our life, like we started saying. And I guess mm -hmm. it doesn't matter too much uh, if you're working or not. At the end of the day, it is a team. Um, mm -hmm. But then, how can we help the the couple? You know, agree on you know, how to manage their finances. Yeah, and it's a um, very good point. And I think everybody or every couple is on a spectrum of completely join their finances or completely separate their finances. And I'm personally in the camp of when you get married, you should just join your finances, even though there's always the risk of, um, you may not end up being together in the long term. But I personally think it's you, there is a commitment. And if you commit to being together, and th I think it should be reflected in your finances. Mm -hmm. um, so when I say completely join, 
it's the easier way to think about it would just be whatever you're making, they all go into a joint checking account and you don't really bother the other person for spending the money in that account. You don't um, really distinguish who makes what money. So um, for couples on one income, it's pretty much the only way to go of join, joining finances because one couple doesn't have income. Mm-hmm. It's all dependent on one cup, uh, the other person. Um, but I know there are couples who are just still trying to um, separate their finances or just not completely join, um, especially if you are newlywed or, um, yeah, just haven't figured out a way to join yet. Mm-hmm. And usually what will happen is that because you both have a paycheck, you will decide, oh, this is our joint expenses, so we'll each put you know, 50% of our paycheck for joint expenses and I can spend the rest, whatever I want, mm-hmm. uh, according to how I want it and the other person doesn't have to know. Um, it works in the beginning, but then you eventually realize because you're living a life together, it's very difficult to start saying, this is my life, this is your life, this is joint life. Mm-hmm. And it will get even harder when you start having children and things like that. So... So what do you recommend in this situation as a financial and a finance planner? Um, my bias is <laughs> go to the joint, the joint um, route. Mm-hmm. So, but it is, like you said, depending on relationship. So only you know how stable your relationship is and how open you are with money with each other. So it really goes really deep into the core of your relationship, how much you trust each other. Mm. with money hopefully and, a lot <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> you spend the rest of your life with somebody <laughs> yeah and sometimes it's not even like i don't love this person sometimes it's more like i love you but after knowing how you spend your money i don't trust you with my money mm. and it's not like um i don't really know how to say it, but like everybody has different relationship as we know so everybody has different relationships with money so it's basically joining all of those together like your relationship with each other and your each relationship with your money so the best way really is to um, have an open conversation um, about your joint life and how you deal with money and sometimes you might need professional help Mm -hmm. with this but Um, it's not a single conversation that's over because when couples talk about money, there can be a lot of emotions involved and how you, you know, how you were raised and this is how you look at money and your spouse may be raised another way and even in another culture Mm -hmm. where money is defined differently. So it goes very deep into, you know, first of all, how each of you view your money and resources and finances and your relationship. I like the fact that you focus a lot here on the relationship and and making sure that we talk about this topic, you know, before we get engaged in this adventure to see if we're in the same, you know, path according to our philosophy of money. And I think that's very important. It seems to be, you know, just money, Mm -hmm. but, but it, and when things get difficult, money can make things even more difficult, I guess. Yeah, and I think that's the one reason, um, I guess, a lot of the your guests earlier also talked about being a trailing spouse and one point in time or another, you need to sort of have redefine yourself and find your own identity, especially when you stop working mm-hmm. and not having your income because so much of our identity can be focused on that and that's your relationship with money yeah. as well thank you for listening that's great <laughs> <laughs> i see that you do listen to tandem nomads <laughs> no i learned a lot of you know, it's it's great that to listen to other people's experience and knowing people going through different things and but you always come back to the same thing of really knowing who you are and be able to anchor yourself on something that doesn't change. 
yeah, for right. the long term. Yeah. I would like to go back to the fact that you mentioned about, because I think this is a very important topic in terms of, of expat couples and trading spouses or expat partners, the fact that we have or not a joint account. And mm-hmm. I, I, I personally do agree with you in the importance of having a joint account, especially if we see our lives together. But I know that I've learned a lot by reading and documenting my educating myself, Tra, mm-hmm. and I realize how, you know, vulnerable extra partners can become if you have a joint account the money comes from the the one who has the job you know Mm -hmm. most of the time it is the the expat and trading spouses do manage to earn money but not enough to become completely dependent if something happens with the husband so Mm -hmm. the thing is it might be also wise to have a second account where we make some savings where we know that nobody else can touch that account just in case in terms of laws for example if you get divorced, if, uh, God forbid, if, if the partner passes away and there are credits we don't know about, I guess it is important to have a second account that's not a daily account to manage, but something like a security, right? Because I think you also have a section, uh, you shared with me a document that we we're going to share with your Tandem Nomads that Huchin prepared to help you plan your expenses. And one of the, one of the sections is the what ifs. And I believe that maybe an account that is a what if account could be wise to open for expert partners yeah so there is i guess the general idea of how do you plan for what ifs and like you mentioned like that's part of the financial planning process like when everything's going really well then you know according to plan that's great but there's always the what if you know what if this happened and the one thing you you mentioned is what if divorce happened? Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's a good idea, not even just for divorce purpose, but for just if you only have joined accounts, there's it's more like depending on wh- where you are and the laws and everything, I can't speak for every country. But if something happens to your, your spouse, it may become an issue when you only have joint account, you don't have immediate access um, to anything belonging to yourself. So in that sense, I do uh, agree with you that it's always good to have um, something of your own name. And I think a lot of um, uh, expat spouses, before they get married, they might have their own accounts Mm -hmm. as well. And usually it's just, you know, keep that open because that's your oldest one before starting before you get married, especially Mm -hmm. if it's a credit card. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, you have the longest credit history on that card. Keep it open. Yeah, it's for it's really just for for what if, mm-hmm. you know, like if for some reason, uh, let's say extreme example, your husband's identity gets stolen and somebody get access to all of your joint accounts mm-hmm. or, or all the, everything that your husband's name's on. If you have something with all your only your name on, then, you know, it's your safety net. Mm-hmm. So, it, but how much you should put in it, it's, it goes back to the planning part and, and the discussion with your spouse. And I, I think that should be open, that you have your own account and the other spouse also has his own account. I think it has to be a common knowledge instead of a secret. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but um, it's actually yeah, a plan for the couple to have, mm-hmm. you know, this extra account. It's not only, I mean, it's, it should not be a secret. That's for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I guess it, we can take it as a, as a given that everything. I mean, the more we share, the more we're transparent in our finance management, the better it is for the relationship. The question is, how can we? Uh, agree what what do you recommend in the relationship to find a way to agree on our expenses because we can't check mm-hmm. every i mean we're not gonna ask every time can i buy that can i i, w- I wouldn't feel comfortable mm-hmm. if i want to buy something and have to the feeling that i need to consult with my husband every time and i don't want him to feel that way either so mm-hmm. but i'm sure that there are certain expenses where we do need to agree mm-hmm. so how would you what would you recommend to find some kind of rule or some kind of balance to be able to consult each other when necessary and not when find an agreement where to consult and where to not? Um, yeah, that's a great question. The 
different couples have different approach. Some approaches I've heard of is giving each other allowance that in, under that amount, they don't have to um, discuss with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, there are also ways we, you can just set a, if this purchase is, if, every, if any single purchase is over, let's say $500, then it's considered big enough in your household and you need to consult with each other before you make the purchase. Mm-hmm. Um, or of, there are also couples I know where they trust each other enough that because they know they've been together enough, they know each other's spending habits and they don't see a reason why to have to even post a rule because that's just their relationship. Mm-hmm. So it really depends on where your relationship at. And I don't think there's a, a one best way to do this, but you know each other the best. You're married mm-hmm. and... Um, you can start with more mechanical way, like I talked about before. And if something comes up, if you have any sort of emotional reactions to this, it's really the, the best time to start asking yourself, why do I feel this way? Mm-hmm. And why do I feel like I'm you know, being constrained? I can only spend $500 on myself per month. Is that really because I'm spending too much, or is it because some, you know, I would never, ha- I was never have to do that. I'm, you know, it has to do with my identity, and no, sort of get to a point where you know why you have certain reactions, and then you can have a more honest discussion with your partner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. on whether this is the best way to do things. That's a good point. Yeah, I don't know if you agree, but for me, just the fact of um, we start, my husband and I, like every end of the month, just sit down for half an hour and go through our expenses of the month. Not by saying, oh, why did you spend that money on that? What did but more to know how, how much money we're spending in our household in order to plan our future and to know how much we have to save. I think, I think it's great that you're doing it. And I think it's a, a good way to start if you've never actually keep track of what you're spending or what your household is spending. Um, I personally um, used a way I called value-based budgeting, mm-hmm. and which is more, it goes back to the whole financial planning idea I was talking about, where there really is more a purpose to why you're doing things. So in a value-based budgeting, you think about your each purpose based on your values. So... It's sort of at the front end. So it's just more a way to nip the bud on the front end mm-hmm. instead of <laughs> at the end of the month, you look at your, you know, your bill and it's like, oh, it's more than I supposed to spend, but it's too late. It, but it's still good to look at it because that way you give an idea that that's how much you spend. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think for, yeah, like you say, for um, people in our situation, when you don't have rent and you value like travel, and things like that more. And, you know, it's absolutely fine to spend more on travel because we don't have, a, we don't have to maintain a, a house. Um, but it's much easier on the front end when you know that, okay, when I'm planning for a trip, this is about the budget that I'm willing to spend. A lot of it is sort of up front, like knowing what you can spend and knowing what... Um, you feel comfortable spending. Mm, definitely, yeah. So um, you've prepared a nice one-page financial plan for Tandem Nomads and Nomad Nation. Uh, you can find it on the page of this episode. I will put the link there. Could you take it through that one-page financial plan? First of all, what it is for? Okay, it's um, actually the idea of one-page financial plan is not my own. It's sort of, I sort of adapted um, from an idea I learned from Carl Richards, who's also a financial planner and a famous um, columnist. Uh, he draws sketches in the New York Times. Mm-hmm. And he has a recent book called One Page Financial Plan where he goes through the same idea I just told, uh, told you about on the importance of planning around your goals. And his one-page financial plan is even simpler. So it's basically just your mission and sort of like the overarching, very big, you know, what kind of life you want to live as a couple mm-hmm. and as a family and, and your goals. And 
So it's really something that you can write on the back of a napkin and just put it on your refrigerator. Mm -hmm. So it keeps reminding you every time you go get something in the refrigerator, you, it reminds you that oh, this is why uh, we do certain things. Having something that's more or less just organized in one page, it helps you to keep going back to it instead of in your head thinking, oh, I'm doing this because, because of this. Nomad Nation, you will find this link to the one-page financial plan and check a, take a look at it and see how it can help you, you know, have a clearer idea of where your financial statement is and what do you think you need to do to get to the goals you're setting for yourself and your relationship and your tandem and your family. And um, Hui Chin, could you tell us more about the services you provide to, to expats and, and mobile families? Um, yeah, so actually there were two things that I want to add to the, the one-page financial plan. It's related to my service as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the one service that I'm starting to... Um, hopefully in a couple months starting to offer is to walk people through that one page financial plan to help them complete it. Mm -hmm. So um, that's more a basic level of if you want to get organized um, to have use that as a template to help you get organized. Um, the, the one thing that this thing doesn't do is tell you whether what you're doing can meet your goals. So for example, you can you can get organized and say, okay, I'm saving $600 a month for goal one and $200 a month for goal two. But that page doesn't tell you whether it's actually going to work mm -hmm. because it, you need to do your own, own analysis and whether you're investing correctly and things like that. Okay. So in general, the entire financial planning process also, although it starts with knowing your goals, a lot of the things that I do is doing the analysis and making sure that you are applying your surplus. And my service also is it's an ongoing service because um, what I really do is I'm more, more like I tell my clients I'm, I'm like a GPS. Mm -hmm. So the, the plan is sort of, of the map, right? And you have the goals as your destination. And we work on where you want to go. You enter it, and I do the calculations on how to help you get there. But then you still need to get there, and you still need me to sometimes tell you to turn left in the next 200 meters or whatever. <laughs> um, so that's you know my service. Like I can sort of help you navigate through all of that. Um, and one most important thing about GPS is that if you you need to detour. Or if you find out that, oh, there is a roadblock, you don't have to, you know, just basically sit there and wondering where you should go next. Mm -hmm. Because GPS helps you calculate that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're the financial GPS. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. It helps us drive through it. our finances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, per I'm actually, I'm personally, I, I really like maps. Like, I like to figure out where to go. So maybe that's what, what makes me a good GPS, <laughs> is that I'm the person who's doing the calculating. <laughs> okay, great. So what is the best way to reach you, Hu Chin? Um, you can um, reach me at Hui Chin, um, money matters at globetrotters.com. I know it's very long, but I guess <laughs> the easiest way is just go to my blog, Mm -hmm. Money matters for globetrotters.com, and you can reach me there very easily. You have some great articles on that blog, Nomad Nation. I really recommend you to go to Money Matters for Globetrotters.com. Yes. Yeah, and there's the um, so for at um, the Money Matters at Globetrotters.com slash Tandem Nomads. That's where you can download the. Um, the one-page financial plan. Okay, just so money matters slash tandem nomads. And I'll put on all the links that will let the Nomad Nation find you. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Great, so thank you very much, Yuchin. Thank you for the time and for explaining us uh, how to do this. Oh, you're welcome. If you enjoyed this episode and find it useful to you, don't hesitate to share it, leave your comment and review. To comment, go to tandemnomads.com, go to the page of this episode and leave your comment at the end of this page. And 
please do not hesitate to leave a review for me. That would be very, very appreciated. You just need to go to the page of this episode. Underneath the play bar, there is a yellow button that says leave a review. Thank you.